My name is Emma Markovich. I work at the National Archives. Uh, my role is Head of Archive Sector Development. And I'm lucky enough to be joined this morning by my colleague, Philip Gale, and also by Tim Crumplin from the Alfred Gillett Trust, um, who is here to talk to us about his experience. So the main thrust of this session is to give you an overview and a bit of context and background into a fund that we were able to launch earlier this year from the National Archives called the, Ar the COVID Fund for Archives. Now, this um, was not something that we expected to be doing. We were very uh, fortunate and pleased to, to get the funding. Um, and we thought you would be interested in hearing something about our experiences of developing what that funding stream was going to look like, delivering it out um, and what our plans might be for the future. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of context for the COVID Fund for Archives. So, of course, the pandemic hit us all like a ton of bricks and we suddenly found ourselves working at home. Our organisations closed down. Uh, no idea um, for how long this, this situation might go on for. So pretty quickly um, at the National Archives, we ran an impact survey across the sector. We wanted to try and get an understanding some quite fast and some quite high level information about what the level of risk was going to be for this situation. So both to collections, also what the risk might be to staff um, and plans for access arrangements, what kind of levels of furlough we were seeing across the sector, where they might be highest, what was the risk of long term closures. So just to really try and get a picture of that, a snapshot for that moment in time, really, we, we thought was quite important. So we ran that survey, thank you all very much, those of you who participated, it was really very useful. There were also, of course, um, a lot of worries about forced or accelerated closure um, or downsizing, particularly in the business part of the sector. Now, of course, that is still potentially quite a high risk, um, but certainly I think at the time of the initial lockdown, it was something everybody was extremely alive to, what was going to happen, would we see you know, fast paced collapse. Um, and then of course, from our, pay, our perspective, what, what happens to those, those collections then, the archives of those businesses. So we were very, very alive to that. Um, we had had some recent experience um, of securing the Thomas Cook archive prior to, to COVID hitting, of course. Um, and that proved a very kind of useful, up-to-date model and, and way of, of, of sort of understanding what the costs might be of having to go in at quite um, quite short notice and um, save collections um, where the business might collapse. So we, we work very closely with the crisis management team, as we always have done, to keep a very um, close eye on, on those, those businesses and try and understand what's mm. coming, what's on the horizon. Um, Debenhams and Arcadia Group were particularly high profile examples, of course, but there are many, many others on a, on a national and, and regional level. Um, so the work of the crisis management team did actually grow hugely over the course of the year, as you can, as you can imagine, unfortunately. Um, and then finally, I suppose we were also quite concerned about private and deposited collections um, and the potentially um, accelerated risk of some of those being sold um, or removed from archive services. Um, and we, we were very aware that that was a risk that might very quickly um, accelerate and increase. And we were also very aware, of course, that National Lottery Heritage Fund and Arts Council England were quickly dispersing their cultural recovery funds for the wider cultural heritage sectors. And that there are, of course, as ever going to be some areas of those funds that archives might fall through the gaps. So we took all of these uh, pieces of evidence and we turned it into a business case that we sent out to Her Majesty's Treasury. Um, and we were awarded £500,000 um, from the Treasury immediately. Um, and that was to spend specifically in grants out across the sector for collections at risk as a result of the pandemic. Um, and we had a very, very quick turnaround on that. Um, so we, the money had to be out of the door by the end of March, I think, gave us the Christmas period really to develop what that fund was going to look like and think about administratively how we were going to distribute it. We are lucky as well in that we have um, experience of distributing grants from the National Archives. As you know, we have our Archives Reveal programme. We have a team, Lucy and Beth, who um, probably some of you have met, 
so far at this conference who are very experienced in doing that. And we were also very fortunate that we had Philip and his team to think through um, from the collections at risk side where they have a lot of experience. So uh, with that in mind, I'm going to hand you over to Philip, who's going to tell you a little bit more detail about the operational management of the fund and some of the evidence we have gathered as a result of it. Let me explain. I'm going to very briefly give an overview of the fund, some of the um, statistics from the fund and some of our plans for the future. The fund was launched um, just before Christmas uh, and the deadline was in the middle of January. Bearing in mind that um, this was not exactly the best time to launch a fund, we received 85 eligible applications from across the United Kingdom. Um, the fund was oversubscribed by a ratio of one to four, with approximately £2 million being sought for a total of £500,000, which incidentally TNA in fact topped up with an additional £7,000. Um, the fund uh, was uh, resulted in 25 grants being awarded to a variety of uh, recipients across the United Kingdom. Details of the fund can be found published on our website uh, and you will see the address on the uh, slide. If we can go to slide number three, please. Um, The interesting thing about these statistical aspects is that 23 of the applicants who had archive service accreditation, 62 applicants did not. Uh, an interesting statistic that suggests where the, perhaps the greatest vulnerabilities are. Um, the fund was essentially to assist with any risk faced by a collection and it funded a variety of interventions, uh, including uh, emergency storage, um, dealing with contaminated re records, and in one case, a record, two cases, record surveys of vulnerable records. Um, the funds were distributed as followed. We received, um, well, first of all, we received 66 applications from England, two from Northern Ireland, 16 from Scotland, and one for Wales. And um, of those eligible applications, um, 40 came from non-public sector applicants, 45 came from public sector applicants. And interestingly, the grants were divided between public sector bodies got 15 grants and the non-public sector bodies got 10 grants. If we could go to slide number four, please. Um, I think what is interesting looking at the grants um, is that the way they were distributed. Um, the grants in the end, we had sent tw 20 went to England, one to Northern Ireland, one to Wales and three to Scotland. And it is interesting that um, the local authorities received, uh, 12 local authorities received grants, um, depending how you define a local authority archive. Um, business and charities received a fair number of eight, uh, we had no overt business archive uh, uh, grants as such, it was, it, with Alfred Gillett Trust being technically a charity, and we had one religious organisation. Um, but what was very clear is that um, the risks faced by um, vulnerable collections uh, are very much focused outside the public sector in the initial phase of the pandemic. I think what the pandemic tells us uh, is that... Um, the differential impact of the pandemic across the archive sector um, is there very clearly. Um, arts, business and charity archives are broadly much more vulnerable than public funded um, funded collections in the first instance. Uh, it may well be with um, public expenditure plans that they, that story may shift. There is also the pandemic, like in so much else of public and uh, national life, it has highlighted existing inequalities of capacities and resources between different parts of the archive sector, whether by region, organisational type or credited status. And so unsurprisingly, um, it is the non-accredited archives that have been facing the greatest risk. And the other pandemic impact clearly is the pace of change has increased with the pandemic with shift to digital collections and access. Uh, if we go to slide number five, please. 
think what our um, experience of this fund shows that there is a distinct structural need uh, for two types of funding. One is for uh, rescue acquisitions for vulnerable collections where a rapid intervention is required at short notice. Uh, and I should be saying a bit more about that later. And the other is uh, perhaps what could be described as resilience funding to mitigate the risks that arise from inadequate premises, workforce skills and wider service capacities, uh, which may have some resonances with the more broader national agenda for levelling up. And above all, there's probably also a need for better mapping and coordination of other sources of funding. And with this in mind, um, we in TNA uh, are looking at the evidence we've collected from uh, the applications to the COVID-19 COVID archives and our COVID-19 fund, and indeed our autumn and spring surveys of COVID impacts across the archive sector last year, to see if there is a case to be made to Treasury for a post-pandemic resilience fund. But clearly that is something that may or may not happen in the future. If we can go to uh, slide number five, please. However, um, we do have uh, plans to create uh, something. Um, right, yes, move, yes, we can move to... Yes, we can move to five. Yep, slide number six, yes. We are having plans, however, to do something about um, the immediate need for rescue funds and now with discussions with the British Records Association as a pilot project to set up a rescue acquisitions fund. Uh, this fund will be eligible for vulnerable collections across the whole United Kingdom, and it's clearly there for emergency funding for such as cleaning, conservation costs, storage and transport costs associated with a collection that's facing an immediate peril. Um, a nice example of a recent example of such an intervention, uh, which happened with the assistance of the British Records Association and the Business Archives Council, was the movement of the majority of the Arcadia Group archives from their London offices up to Leeds, uh, where the costs were actually supported by the BAC and the BRA. And that's the sort of intervention we hope to be able to fund. Uh, as I say, we hope to launch this fund in autumn 2021. Um, there is um, quite a lot that we could do with, the, I think, the data to get a better understanding of where the risks lie. But I think the headline is that uh, clearly collections that have not got the protection of archive service accreditation and those particularly vulnerable to the impacts of the pandemic and then charities and the business community, and indeed some private collections where owners are no longer got that visitor-based income uh, are, are very real. And indeed some of the consequences of the pandemic may become more apparent as we move to the post-pandemic phase and we will see which businesses and charities thrive and which ones may falter. That's enough from me. I'm going to introduce you to Tim Crumplin, who's going to give you um, the recipient's experience of the fund um, and how he found it as a fund to go with uh, as, as a recipient. Thanks very much, Philip. Uh, uh, I was intending to uh, share with you um, a representation of the institution, the collection uh, that I, I work for or with, uh, our predicament, our application, and our intended outputs as a consequence of having applied for the fund and being successful in receiving um, some money. As an employee of the Afro Gillett Trust, uh, the Afro Gillett Trust is a charitable institution that operates from the Grange in, uh, in Street. It's a Grade Two listed building in Somerset. Um, and the, uh, the, the trust itself was established by the Clark family. Uh, they established the trust for three main reasons. Uh, firstly, to care for the internationally significant business archive that spans seven generations of a Quaker family shoe firm, C&J Clark, which is known more generically as Clark's, or to many people as Clark's Shoes, and is represented on the high street um, in most major kind of conurbations. It's also an international um, uh, shoe uh, business now uh, that, uh, that trades globally. It's a global, global, global name. Um, we also uh, created the trust, or the trust has been created to, uh, to hold collections pertaining to its host community, which is Street. And Street in Somerset is uh, it's a model industrial town, which has kind of grown up around the factory, 
pretty much. Uh, this particular representation is probably not the best one of a, a model town, but I wanted to show you the proximity to uh, Glastonbury and hopefully in so doing, people have a better idea of where that is geographically. As street, with the exception of uh, shoe manufacturing, is a fairly small place. Um, and finally, the trust was established by the Clark family to preserve the collections of the Clark family itself. So as Quakers, um, as nonconformists, um, uh, they were very active in educational and social reform, um, the abolition of slavery, um, uh, suffrage, temperance, those kinds of activities. And it's those collections that we want to also increase accessibility to and uh, encourage researchers to come and work with. So in terms of our relationship with the TNA, um, uh, the Africa Trust benefited from a fairly proactive approach. We were very lucky um, in the early um, stages of the pandemic. In fact, I think this coincided purely by chance. Uh, our um, development manager for the Southwest, uh, Tim Powell, had actually communicated with us and said that he would like to visit um, in January 2020 uh, and that he was going to try and put us into uh, contact with some regional network um, uh, contacts like uh, Georgie uh, Salzido and uh, Philippa Turner and that they wanted to come to, to the Trust in March 2020. So we were all quite, quite excited by this. Obviously, um, March 2020 didn't happen. We went into lockdown, I think it was March the 16th, um, and remained in lockdown for, for most of the subsequent year. Um, uh, the initial uh, communication, I suspect, from Tim had probably been provoked by the fact that um, the Trust had actually advertised for a collections manager at this point. And uh, we were actually beginning to engage as part of that um, uh, appointment in a project to empty the context, uh, the contents of a 300 foot X shoe components factory that we have in Castle Carey, which we've been using as a remote storage facility. Uh, and we kind of broken up into sections. Um, this storage facility we'd had for about 20 years. We were using it to accommodate um, three sections of shoe machinery, um, footwear collections, but also a, a fairly substantial business archive. Now, um, it was fairly poorly suited to storage uh, for heritage purposes. As you can see, it's a single skin building. It's got a tin roof and it has, it has a river running beneath it, a stream running beneath it. Sometimes the stream runs through it, but more often than not, it's just beneath. Um, we also have uh, uh, a fragility of, about the building, certainly in terms of the heating system, but also the very fabric of the, the building. And uh, this had prompted the trust to start removing a material uh, from the, uh, from the building in, in 2019 in small uh, areas where we had uh, specific problems. So as you can see here, fairly significant water ingress. Um, work wasn't supposed to begin in, in a concerted sense though until 2020 um, and uh, following the appointment of the collections manager, but this was prevented by lockdowns. Uh, we had furlough as well for quite a few staff members, including myself off and on. So we weren't able to make the progress that we needed to make in um, 2020. Um, the, the, the situation was compounded as well by the terminal failure of the heating system. I actually went up to, a, to Castle Carey during lockdown just to check on it and was fairly alarmed to, uh, to witness this. Uh, I think the thermostat had failed and the machine was actually glowing red. So we had to um, uh, intervene and lock off all heating, which uh, prompted the rapid uh, degeneration of the facility during the following winter period and culminated in a further th uh, threat to the collections. So whilst that was happening to the physical collections themselves, um, we had additional problems too, in that um, the business archive had been deposited on loan uh, from Clarks, uh, who acted or act very much as one of the trust's principal stakeholders. Um, they provide income through uh, shares, uh, the dividends that, that accrue off of those uh, helps to finance the trust, but also in payment of an ongoing service charge for, for services that we provide them with. And um, I think with Clark's, it raised concerns within the trust because, I mean, as a retail company, Clark struggled. I mean, they'd, they'd um, been forced to close their retail outlets for most of uh, 2020, as most uh, high street um, uh, businesses had been forced to close their um, their outlets uh, and there were redundancies and rumours that clerks would be sold which uh, raised even further concerns within the trust as to what might happen to the collections and this characterised most of uh, 2020. Um, the purchase of clerks by um, Lion Rock Capital actually only occurred in late December 2020 so throughout that period um, as I say we were 
we were quite concerned about the uh, collections, but it was actually latterly in the very sort of late stages of uh, December 2020 that the trust managed to purchase the business collection from Clarks as part of the Lion Rock Capital transaction. So that kind of set, uh, provides some context um, uh, and sort of the, the backdrop um, to how or you know when the TNA launched, launched its COVID-19 archives fund. And that seemed to us at least a very sort of pragmatic approach to an unprecedented situation and offered us much needed support at a time when we um, most needed it. Needed it. Um, uh, I think it, um, it, uh, it, tar it targeted um, uh, short notice work and it was obviously a crisis fund, you know, which, which and it was kind of set up very much as a crisis fund, which suited our situation. Um, and it wasn't um, limited by what we could um, um, ask for. Uh, or what the money might be spent upon, but it was very much a salvage fund as far as we could see. And we'd now found ourselves very much in a salvage uh, situation where we kind of planned a very um, uh, measured approach to, uh, to salvaging this collection in 2019, 2020. We were now in a situation where we had to move the collection quite quickly. Um, uh, as Philip has also said, um, the eligibility criteria was very good for us um, because it wasn't explicitly dependent upon accreditation and it gave us an opportunity to, to apply as an institutional archive um, uh, with, um, you know, that was connected to a record creating body. I think also uh, it was uh, tailored, as Philip has said, very much towards the charity and their private records at risk in the public domain area, which to, um, to my mind was acknowledgement of the threat that was being faced by um, smaller institutions such as ourselves. Now, as an applicant to the, um, uh, to the, uh, the fund, um, I found that the, uh, the eligibility criteria was both uh, well-defined and well-executed. Um, the amount of money available was well-suited too, in that it wasn't a huge amount of money, but it wasn't a, a small amount of money either. So it actually made it very flexible, very, very kind of fluid and very fast to kind of enact, which was exactly what we needed at the time. Um, the application process, while simple, was also well supported. So as I mentioned, Tim Powell, he was very good. He actually um, initiated uh, correspondence with me when the, um, the uh, fund was uh, launched. We'd actually considered going for it and we thought we probably would. But I think him um, communicating with me and saying that I'm aware of the problems that you're encountering. And I suspect this fund would actually be um, uh, very, very useful to you. Uh, was very good for me because as a small institution you know we've got a very small collections team we're very kind of practically focused uh, bid writing fund writing isn't something that anybody has kind of within their job description really um, but uh, in being able to go to, to my line manager and sort of saying that we'd also been encouraged to apply by um, TNA I think that gave me um, much needed kind of um, support in being able to convince her that it was uh, time well spent. I think she would have supported it anyway, but it certainly didn't. Um, uh, it certainly didn't obstruct uh, the issue. Um, and as well, Philip, as head of uh, standards and improvement, was very good. I mean, I had a, a thirty-minute pre-application um, meeting where they basically allowed me to pour my heart out for ten minutes and tell them of my situation, and then spent twenty minutes, you know, very sensibly like discussing my eligibility, how I might frame uh, an application, um, uh, you know, and, uh, and, you know, when I had to have, have applied by, which, which for me was an invaluable sort of 30 minutes. Um, it wasn't uh, limited to what I might uh, apply for either, and it accommodated all the practicalities of saving my collection, which was very good. Um, uh, I found the uh, process of applications appraisal also very streamlined. So by the time we'd actually submitted the application, I think we only had to wait for it, something like a, a month, six weeks, to actually know whether we'd been successful in our application. And there was also a very rapid authorization of funds. Um, uh, Philip kind of prompted me on, on uh, criticisms, and I don't really have a great many. I think the only thing I could come up with was the accountability element. Um, uh, and whether that might be developed either going through, um, through the project or at the end of the project. But having said that, you know, I think I've had such effective um, assistance from my uh, TNA regional representative, and they've already said that they would like to visit as soon as uh, conditions, circumstances permit. The likelihood is that kind of overarching level of, um, I sort of going to call it surveillance, um, uh, will happen anyway. So that was also very good. Um, moving on to the application itself and what we applied for, um, as the trust, we applied for funding to purchase two uh, decommissioned or refrigerated insulated 40-foot shipping uh, containers. 
and we wanted to locate these in the grounds of the Grange and Street so that we could provide a facility that we could transfer the uh, archive collections from Castle Carey to and process them ready for a shift into the archive. I mean, we, we kind of wanted to um, use shipping containers specifically because we realised that we could um, install them quickly to remove the collection from the poor environment at Castle Carey as quickly as possible. And this was kind of, as I say, now is the priority. It's just getting the material out of the environment it's in and trying to put it into more stable uh, conditions where we can quarantine and repackage the collection in a more controlled environment. Um, we also wanted to try and improve accessibility um, with a greater versatility on our main site um, where we can actually enact social distance and then we've got additional amenities uh, to allow staff and uh, volunteers as well importantly to come to return safely back to site. We can actually increase the number of people on the project and we can also accelerate its progress as a consequence. And we can also position these uh, storage containers um, uh, close or join them to, to our purpose-built archive. So actually that processing and that um, transition into the archive should be that much, um, that much easier. But we also wanted to um, uh, uh, incorporate some level of sustainability into our project too. So we were keen to relocate the collection, the business collection to streets so that it would aid outreach um, we wanted to implement a predefined business hierarchy so that we could make the collection um, uh, more accessible and start to catalogue it or improve the cataloguing of the collection to make it more accessible. Um, we also want to develop the trust profile and make the collection more accessible to academia. That was one of the, the big pushes, really. Um, these collections, a lot of it hasn't been shared with the general public, either the family collections or the business collection. And this is one of our kind of key um, criteria. Um, as well, we wanted to contribute to the sector. So the use of uh, shipping containers, particularly in um, disaster areas and uh, as a kind of a disaster response. And when I was actually uh, formulating my application, I'd seen very sort of scant uh, research really. So there's a little bit by Ted Ling, which is he's, he's produced a really good article, um, probably nearly 20 years old now. But with the exception of that, the only thing I came across was uh, a research poster that had been um, uh, used at a conference by Fruentes and Griswold and we really wanted to be able to contribute to that understanding of the use of our storage containers in uh, the storage of um, heritage collections and contribute to the sector by doing so um, and we've also considered ways that the shipping containers might be repurposed uh, for outreach activities or exhibitions moving into the future. So those were the reasons um, why we applied for the um, uh, the money and those and I've also tried to outline you know how we're, we're going to uh, to use the money I think as as as, uh, as 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 conclusions it's been a good introduction to us in terms of uh, funding applications for a fledgling organization we haven't really applied for money in the past but I think we see this now as a launch pad to be able to to actually start to fashion uh, 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 bids moving forward and funding applications um, I think as well, it allows us to, it's a precursor to, to applications for more established opportunities like Archives Revealed, which is something that we've uh, already touched upon um, this morning. Uh, I think it's, in, it's, it's probably raised our institutional confidence as well, and uh, has certainly made us start to consider the prospect of beginning the process of accreditation as an organisation, which was something that we've always considered, but I think now is something that we will probably push on with. And I think as well, you know, finally, the last thing I think is um, acknowledgement of uh, the assistance that was given us to, to us by TNA and the ongoing assistance that they provide in terms of um, uh, the provision of advice and training for funding applications. Uh, and I think that's something that's obviously been identified as something that's quite important, you know, particularly for smaller or um, uh, fledgling uh, trusts or heritage organisations with archives. Uh, like ourselves um, but uh, yeah that's that's it from me and um, I'm assuming we'll go back to Emma but thank you absolutely brilliant Tim thank you so much um, it was really really helpful to get that very kind of detailed walkthrough um, and you touched on on so many issues that I think have been brought around by um, by this fund and the experience that we we've all had as as applicants and and as the as the lead organisation in in delivering it. So there are there's an awful lot of ways in which this this conversation could go. I think um, 
I would just like to pick up on something that you said, um, and that I think Philip might want to just say a couple of words on, which is about how we kind of measure the impact. That's obviously going to be really very important in helping us build the case for further funding going forward is what actual impact have these current projects had um, and how we, we, how we work with you going forward to evaluate and show what that looks like. Um, and I know Philip has got a, a kind of a process in mind for doing that. Um, but also just to say one of the other things that that's brought out, as you as you said very strongly in your presentation, is that you might not have been the, the type of organisation we would usually have worked with. And, and some of the experiences you've had have kind of led you to think quite differently about um, applying for accreditation and, and applying for funding and so on in the future. And that's something else that's really positive and I think a real learning experience for us at the National Archives as well in terms of thinking about the types of organisations that we traditionally work with and, and how this, this experience might, might change that too. So sorry, Philip, I don't know if you wanted to add anything there. Yes, just to say that we, we do have an evaluation plan. Uh, this will be news for the grantees, but um, we are going to hold a webinar uh, within the next month with we invite all the grantees to attend where we'll explain what we hope to do. Um, we're going to send out a monitoring form and then we're going to hold interviews with each of the grantees to go through the form with them. And on that basis, we will probably visit a select number of the grantees um, to follow up. Um, this is very important because our credibility with our auditors and more importantly, the government means it's important that we are seen to be spending public money effectively and in monitoring the impacts. And this will also feed into the evidence base for making the case for more funding in the future. Um, and there's also the possibilities um, for uh, one or two case studies, perhaps, to become to be published uh, with the agreement of those grantees. And they are very varied. We are talking from uh, Wheel Martin Trust in Cornwall. Um, right up to the Ballast Trust in Scotland um, uh, as well. So we are talking a wide range. So we are very much on the case. Uh, and there'll be further developments in the next few days. Fantastic. Thank you very much. OK, so I'm going to turn to the questions in the Q&A. Please keep them coming in. We do have a little bit of time. And as I say, there are an awful lot of kind of themes and, and ways in which this, this conversation could go. Um, Absolutely brilliant question from Mary McKenzie, who says, given Philip's point about non-accredited archive services and collections being more at risk, can you tell us what support is available to help services become accredited? And are there any thoughts on funding for this purpose? So I do think that's an absolutely great question because obviously accreditation is at the core of so much of what we do. Um, and we are absolutely clear from the start that we don't want to disadvantage any organisations who are not in a position to go for accreditation. I think it's that's why it's so, so important and interesting to hear Tim's point about now kind of that Alfred Gillett Trust will be thinking much more in those terms and, and about going for that. Um, I think accreditation um, as a process, on the one hand, is an awful lot of work. Um, but on the other hand, it's really about trying to see that work as part of a process that could take as long as it takes in many ways and is a way in which the organisation can really help itself by putting in place some of those policies and practices that feed into the final accreditation application. So I think we're trying um, as an accreditation committee to really kind of make those points at the moment. Um, we've been really aware that there's also a, a discrepancy across regions as well, across um, Scotland and Wales and, and on that kind of national level as well. And even those organisations who are thinking about accreditation, who are perhaps already accredited, you know, even those organisations are begin are wondering you know how they can how they can resource this process so it's a very very live conversation um, at the level of the of the committee um, and and certainly there, there's a, a high level of awareness that there are organizations who will who will not feel that they are in a position to apply and I think that it's 
one of the things that we want to do and one of the things we've talked about a lot is this point about changing the way we think about accreditation in many ways and I, and I think that aligns quite closely with the Arts Council and the approach they're taking to the museum's accreditation process as well which is really about using this as a process to get everything in place um, over time which will be a, a huge help to your organisation in, in many many ways. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that Philip. Well, obviously, our regional team uh, are there to help. As Tim says, our regional team is a very active agent in encouraging accreditation and supporting people through accreditation. And maybe one possible aspect of any resilience funding that we might be able to put together maybe is some financial support in helping people move towards accreditation. Um, it's very encouraging that experience of the fund is making people feel that accreditation is useful because it is the ultimate risk mitigation measure available. Uh, if you're accredited archive, you've got some protection um, by being able to point to a framework that makes it harder for your employer or organisation to just ignore the archive or disinvest from it. So um, it's extremely important that um, we try and support accreditation, particularly as it reaches a mature stage of its development, because it's now about eight years old uh, and it has all the challenges of digital as well to look forward to. Yeah, that's true. Of course, it's a constantly moving process. Um, and uh, you're absolutely right. The regions team at National Archives are amazingly helpful, a huge source of support. And I also want to say by way of a kind of a shout out and a thanks to Philip as well, um, that he has been extraordinary in the, through the process of this fund. At one point, I think you had at least 60 conversations with organisations trying to, to help them. In the, in I had the, over 100 meetings over the course <laughs> of the night, So, so it's an week, amazing so. thing. Um, <laughs> thank you. OK, so the next question. Um, this one is for you, Tim, I think, really. Um, did the Alfred Gillett Trust have any problems getting quotations for goods and services they wanted to include in the bid, given that suppliers were also experiencing disruption? Well, um, we, we basically went out to, um, to, I mean, what we do as part of um, uh, the process anyway, would be to get three, three, three quotes, I'm assuming, for all of the work that we wanted. Um, uh, but I mean, the thing, one of the things is uh, the, the change of cost, I think, of things currently. So um, I remember one of our trustees smiling at me and saying, well, you've, you know, you've done really well there because you've, you've asked for uh, storage containers, which at the moment, everybody wants storage containers or they're stuck in docks. So the price of those is changeable. I mean, I had to kind of estimate a storage container in the end because the storage container suppliers were effectively saying, we'll only give you three days I think it was even less than that actually for a quote you know it wouldn't stand for any longer than that because prices were so fluid and then obviously we've had um price changes with um uh, raw materials with builders with our uh, contractors grounds groundsmen so yeah there were there were issues um it wasn't so much a problem uh i mean the um the storage container like quotations were quite easy to get because obviously they were they were distanced but usually with a uh, groundwork it was a case of needing to get somebody on site to assess the site which was hard because it was it was a closed facility so um luckily most of the people you know with with photographs we were able to get individuals to give us quotes so that was that was quite that was quite lucky you know they could quote on site pretty much i mean they've been on site since just to verify that you know they can do what they've promised to do within the, the realms of what they propose to charge but um, yeah, I mean, it, it has been a bit fluid, you know, and certainly in terms of what we asked for and, you know, what we will now have to spend, that has changed to some degree. Um, but it's kind of absorb absorbable. I think that was one of my, that was one of my principal concerns, I think, when I applied just how, how much um, prices have changed. I think storage containers um, had changed, say, for example, 10 to 15 percent within the space of actually um, uh, putting the, uh, the request in and then actually going back to, to pay for um, you know, a storage container. So, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, the, the point, yeah, that it was a very good question, very astute question, and it has been a problem. Thank you. And we certainly had feedback from other applicants as well. In some cases, they couldn't even um, get quotes. Um, so we were aware as part of the process that that was an issue and tried to be flexible accordingly, I think. OK, um, did you want to add anything, Philip? If you did, you've probably got about a minute. Um, well, only just to say, I say this has been enormously uh, much a team effort, not just within TNA, but right across the sector. Uh, and um, it has been a strong learning curve. 
and we very much want to build for the future on this so that we don't just leave it as a one-off so um hopefully you'll be hearing more about our collections of risk work in the years to come no absolutely it's um it's all ongoing very live very much uh, uh, on our radar very much um a concern and i agree it's been an absolutely great um experience in terms of Working with new organisations, hearing from Tim today really kind of does underline um, how this fund has actually been able to, to be so supportive in many other ways than just actually giving money for a particular bit of intervention work. So I think that's been a really important thing to draw out from this conversation. And thank you very much.